Turing's contribution was not just developing such a simple model of computation, but also showing that it was powerful to do any computation, powerful enough to do any computation that we might imagine. That concept is called universality. So that a, a Turing machine is nothing more than a finite sequence of symbols. Uh, we have our decrement or Turing machine that we uh, drew out graphically, uh, but uh, we had a text file representation of it that's just a bunch of symbols. Uh, so in particular, what we can do is we can put a Turing machine and its input on a Turing machine tape. Uh, just lay out uh, this table uh, with spaces in between uh, with different symbols on the tape. So uh, there's an input we might want to run on the left and then uh, this complete description of the Turing machine. The Turing machine and its input uh, all described with a finite sequence of symbols. And what that means is that uh, we can then develop another Turing machine that can take that as the input and simulate its operation. Since any Turing machine can be described with finite set of symbols in this way, this Turing machine that uses this as input is going to be able to simulate the operation of any other Turing machine, just like our Java program did. That's the idea of a universal Turing machine, a Turing machine that takes as input any other, any Turing machine, an input for that Turing machine on a tape. Uh, so uh, that's a particular machine called a universal Turing machine, uh, and that's our example where we had our increment input to our decrement or Turing machine and then our decrement or Turing machine. You could put any Turing machine there. And then what the universal Turing machine does is leave on the tape ex precisely what uh, the Turing machine that's on the tape would leave on the tape if it were run on that input. Or if that machine loops, the universal Turing machine would loop or ends in yes, no, all. It, it would do exactly what uh, the Turing machine that's on the tape would do. Uh, in this case, it would wind up uh, decrementing the number uh, input by one uh, and blanking out the rest of the tape. Uh, so Turing figured this out, that simply simulating a Turing machine is a, a simple computational task. You can do it with the basic operations that we have laid out for a Turing machine. So since it's a simple computational task, there's a Turing machine to do it. That's a universal Turing machine. Uh, maybe an easier way to think about it is uh, look at every, each thing, everything that our Java simulator does and each piece of it think about building a Turing machine, a piece of a Turing machine that could do that. Uh, really often all we're go doing is going and looking up in a table uh, what state should I go to next uh, and so forth. Uh, it's a, quite a simple uh, uh, computational task. Our simulator gives uh, a roadmap for it. Uh, we don't have to uh, build a constructor because everything's already on the tape. Uh, but simulating the infinite tape, we don't have to worry about that part of it because the Turing machine already has an infinite tape. But the, most of it is uh, updating the state, as I indicated. Uh, so uh, if you want to see the details or build your own Turing machine for any computational task, uh, this is something that uh, there's lots of resources for. In fact, we have a whole Turing machine development environment on the book site. And one of the things that's there is a 24 state universal Turing machine uh, that you can go ahead and uh, study and, uh, and run on our decrementer or any other Turing machine that you want. Simulates the operation of any Turing machine uh, if you put the input in that Turing machine uh, on the tape. Uh, if you think the 24 is a small number, actually people have developed universal Turing machines that have only four states uh, with six different symbols. Uh, just warning, uh, if you get into working with Turing machines uh, and you like uh, working with discrete processes and programming, uh, it can be addictive and you'll find lots of examples uh, on the book site of Turing machines that people have developed for all sorts of computational tasks. Uh, but the idea of, of universality is really profound. A universal Turing machine is a very simple model of, comp of computation uh, that's universal actually in a precise uh, technical sense. Uh, we're going to call a task computable 
if a Turing machine exists that can compute it. Uh, and what Turing proved is that it's possible to invent a single machine that can be used to do any computable task. So that's a, the, the proof is the uh, existence of a universal Turing machine. Uh, that's uh, uh, Turing's uh, main theorem, you know, one of his main theorems. And so uh, one thing is that if you can simulate a Turing machine, you could actually simulate uh, a universal Turing machine. So if you, any machine that you make, if it can simulate the operation of a Turing machine, then it can simulate, it can do any computable task, because in particular it can do a universal Turing machine, which can do any computable task. And that means that uh, uh, in terms of what you can compute, uh, any one machine is universal. We don't have to build separate computers for each task that we might encounter, like solving scientific problems or doing email or playing music. It means that all the computers all the, that we can invent, invent are uh, equivalent. They're universal in that they can do uh, anything that a Turing machine can do, which means they can do any computable task. Uh, and that's a very profound result that uh, has lots of uh, practical uh, implications as well. Uh, here's just a, a, an example. And maybe you've seen this example. Uh, it's called the game of life. Uh, it's a different, uh, simple, uh, formal model of computation uh, called a cellular automaton. So we think of an infinite square grid with cells that can live and die under specific rules. It's discrete. Time proceeds in discrete steps. Uh, and uh, there's a couple of rules that determine whether cells live or die. Uh, so it depends on uh, the values of its eight neighbors. If a cell has two few neighbors alive, either zero or one, it dies of loneliness. Uh, if the number of living neighbors is just right, two or three, then it's going to live to the next generation. Uh, and if there's too many alive, more than three, it dies of overcrowding. And then the other rule is that uh, a cell is born if uh, it has exactly three living neighbors. Uh, these are simple rules and you see how they work in just a second. So suppose we have this configuration at a particular time t. Then what we can do is uh, for every cell you can count the number of neighbors, it's eight uh, direct neighbors, uh, and these are the counts uh, for this, and you can uh, figure out uh, what's going to happen to each cell based uh, on those counts. Uh, the one at the fringes are zero. Uh, there's a couple that have exactly three, uh, and there's uh, one that uh, a couple that uh, uh, die of loneliness, and uh, one that dies of overcrowding. Uh, and you can check that in time t plus one, uh, we get a different configuration. So uh, uh, question is, uh, what what's the story with this uh, discrete model of uh, of computation? It really is a model of computation, as you'll see. Uh, so the idea of Conway's game of life is that even very simple rules like that, even simpler than the Turing machine, can lead to pretty complicated behavior. And very early on, uh, one of the uh, things that you know, people realize is uh, there's a thing called a glider. And after one, two, three, four steps, uh, the thing has the same form, but it moves, uh, moves down through the grid. And again, it's infinite in all directions, so uh, if you get that configuration, uh, it'll move. Now, uh, you can write a Java program to uh, implement the game of life to see what happens. And uh, I wrote one. That's how we get the demos, uh, some of the demos that we've done here. Uh, it's a very simple program that maybe uh, could have been an assignment uh, when we discussed arrays. Uh, but the input to that program can lead to uh, interesting and complicated behavior. Uh, one thing that's quite amazing is a thing called a glider gun. Uh, if you start out like this, uh, then here's what happens. It uh, looks pretty complicated, but after a while, uh, what you can realize is that uh, this glider gun, it uh, bounces around at the top there, but it spins off gliders. 
And when you think about it, that's actually pretty profound that we can get that kind of behavior from such simple rules. Those gliders out there, uh, that's transmitting information. And if we can transmit information, uh, maybe there's more that we can do. And there's another level. There's a glider gun breeder that generates glider guns that all generate gliders. Extremely complex behavior. Uh, so one thing uh, that uh, someone has figured out is what, what happens if you have that starting configuration. Pretty complicated starting configuration, but if you study it uh, just for a minute, and, and uh, you can, uh, well, you have to study it quite a bit, but you can uh, understand when I say that actually what that thing is is a universal Turing machine. You can kind of see the tape going off uh, along the diagonal uh, and then the state diagram uh, as a little array uh, down in the bottom left. Uh, so with the game of life, we can build a, a universal Turing machine. That means anything that we can compute, and that's the Turing machine's definition of what we can compute, we can compute with the game of life. Uh, it's quite surprising. It's a very profound connection to the real world. And what Church and Turing uh, articulated, and uh, this was because many people were working on different models of computation, and they were trying to see if one would be more powerful than another, uh, like we saw with our uh, one stack and two stack machines uh, at the end of the last lecture. And by the way, a two stack machine, as you saw when we simulated a tape with two stacks, uh, you can make that like a Turing machine. Uh, so uh, two stack machines are equivalent to Turing machines, so therefore they can compute anything Turing machines can and they're uh, equivalent. And what uh, Church and Turing articulated is that uh, anything that we can do in this universe uh, is going to be uh, equivalent. Uh, that uh, a universal Turing machine, it can simulate a universal Turing machine, universal Turing machine can simulate it, so they're, very, they're all equivalent, all compute the same thing. Now, this is something that can't be proved because it relates to uh, the universe, physical uh, properties of the universe. It could, be, uh, it could be falsified, but we can never prove that it's true. Uh, so uh, the thing is, ever since this thesis was articulated, uh, if someone wants to study a new model of computation or a new discrete physical process, uh, we can use simulation to prove that it's equivalent to some known physical process or model of computation that we already know to be equivalent to Turing machines. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll see uh, later on in the course uh, of a small uh, machine that we define that we can simulate in Java and vice versa. Uh, and uh, when you have the uh, Java compiler, uh, you can, uh, what that does is uh, take a Java program and make it run on a simple machine. So those machines are equivalent. And uh, with the Java simulator, uh, we showed equivalence one way with Turing machines, I and mean, you could show uh, equivalence the other way with uh, a couple of steps. Uh, in general, it's not difficult to use simulation to prove computational models uh, equivalent. And what that means is that uh, if you believe that, then there's no need to look for a machine that can compute more once you've got past the two-state machine. It's all about convenience and efficiency, but not about uh, the kinds of problems that can be solved. And that is uh, very important because it enables us to have a rigorous study of what computation is uh, in this universe if uh, we believe the church Turing thesis. Uh, and there's a lot of evidence in favor of this because many, many, many models of computation have been shown to be equivalent. Uh, and this is just a, uh, a short list, uh, some of which uh, came from uh, uh, mathematicians trying to uh, come up with uh, more powerful models of computation and others that just arise practically as uh, people develop uh, different ways to compute things. Uh, in fact, uh, over uh, eight decades, uh, people have developed lots and lots of different models of computation and still going, uh, and they all turn out to be equivalent in terms of uh, 
uh, the problems that can be solved with a computational device. All starting with the Turing machine, this is simple uh, m machine articulated by Turing as a, as a definition of uh, what we can compute. And these universal models sometimes are, bear a striking resemblance to nature. Uh, this is a model called a Lindemeyer system, uh, which is a formal model, uh, uh, not much more complicated than a Turing machine, but then can be linked to uh, graphical models that uh, makes, makes us think, well, uh, is there computability uh, actually to be found in nature? These kinds of questions are profound uh, and important.